It's a truth universally acknowledged that with great power comes great responsibility. Taking into account both the comics and the TV series, here are some of the worst things the Umbrella Academy has ever done. Whether you're talking about the comics or the TV series, there's no denying Reginald Hargreaves is the worst. After all, he probably caused all those spontaneous, non-consensual pregnancies through his magic alien sparkles resulting in the births of the Hargreaves' children. And then he raised the seven kids he was able to purchase in a sterile, unloving environment where his only focus was on the children's special abilities and not their emotional needs. Yet, while Hargreaves mistreated all of his adopted children to varying degrees, it's no contest when it comes to which one of the Hargreaves' siblings drew the shortest straw. Poor Vanya Hargreaves was raised to believe she had no powers at all and was therefore unworthy in every sense of the word. It's only once she becomes an adult that she learns she's actually the most powerful of the seven and that her father had been suppressing her abilities with medication her whole life, claiming she needed it to regulate her mental health. Not only did he lie to Vanya for decades, but he excluded her from the Umbrella Academy's missions, causing her to feel distanced from her family and doubt her own self-worth. I'm afraid there's just nothing special about you. Reginald Hargreaves was a horrible father no matter how you slice it, but his treatment of Vanya took the cake. As a child, Alison Hargreaves received her superhero moniker, The Rumor, thanks to her ability to use her voice to convince anyone to do anything she wanted. With a gift like that, the world is truly Alison's oyster, and once she leaves home as a teenager, she uses it to her full advantage. Alison rumors herself into fame and fortune, which, while definitely not the most forthright way to engage with the world, at least doesn't seem to be hurting anyone. However, she crosses a line in both the comics and the series when it's implied that she rumors a man named Patrick into falling in love with her and subsequently marrying her. While we never get a detailed look at Allison and Patrick's relationship, it seems that at some point, Allison told Patrick about her powers and agreed to stop using them. However, their marriage fell apart when he caught her using her powers on their daughter, Claire. Good luck on your next film. I hope it turns out better than your marriage. Dysfunctional is honestly a pretty tame way of describing the dynamic among the Hargreave siblings. But at least the Netflix characters make slightly more of an effort to establish meaningful relationships with one another than the siblings in the comics do. However, one place in which the TV heroes really drop the ball is toward the end of the first season of The Umbrella Academy, when the men of the Hargreaves family utterly disregard the opinions and suggestions of their sisters. After Luther realizes how powerful Vanya is, he betrays her trust when she returns home to ask for help, choking her unconscious and locking her in a soundproof bunker underneath the mansion. Vanya pleads with him to let her out, but he refuses to listen to her. Allison, whose throat Vanya slit in a fit of rage, also demands that Luther release Vanya, but he won't listen to her either. Later, after Vanya escapes and destroys the Academy, Allison beseeches her brothers to try to talk to Vanya, but this time all of them ignore her and attempt to attack Vanya instead, which does not go well. Not only does this strip both Vanya and Allison of their agency, but with the men calling all the shots, the women are literally robbed of their voices. In both the comics and the TV show, Klaus, also known as The Seance and Number 4, winds up time-traveling back to the 60s, where he enlists in the army and fights in the Vietnam War. However, the details of Klaus's time in the 60s are very different, and while the TV series sees him falling in love with and then witnessing the death of a young soldier named Dave, the comics don't give him a tragic love story. Instead, they give him a job running a nightclub and creating a televator, a sort of TARDIS-like transport originally invented by Reginald Hargreaves that allows occupants to travel through space, time, and other dimensions. When it's finally time for Klaus, Diego, and Luther to head back to their time in the Televator, Klaus hands an unexplained baby he'd been carrying around off to a local Vietnamese woman. It turns out that much to everyone's surprise, the baby belongs to Klaus, although we never learn anything about the mother or even the baby's name. Truthfully, it's probably good that Klaus realized he had no business raising a baby. On the other hand, especially given his own upbringing, it seems rather callous that he just casually hands off his own child without much of a thought before departing forever, and he never mentions his offspring ever again. Both the second season of Netflix's The Umbrella Academy and the second volume of the comics center around the assassination of John F. Kennedy, but the way it plays out in each is very different. In both the TV series and the comics, Number 5 winds up duking it out with his older self after he's tasked with killing the president. 
But in the TV show, it's actually the Sinister Majestic 12 organization that carries out the assassination plot, absolving the Umbrella Academy of any role in the death. However, in the comics, things play out very differently. After witnessing a cataclysmic future in which Kennedy survives, setting off a chain of events leading to the end of the world, Five travels to the past intent on making sure the assassination is carried out. Like in the show, his brothers are determined to stop the assassination, but Five has accounted for this. Just when his siblings think they've stopped the assassination, we see that Allison has taken Jackie Kennedy's place in Kennedy's car, and she rumors Kennedy's head to explode. In season two of the Netflix series, after the entire Hargreaves clan accidentally travels through time back to the 60s, Klaus drops into the year 1960 alongside the ghost of his dead brother, Ben, also known as the Horror and Number Six. Ben died when they were all teenagers, but thanks to Klaus's ability to communicate with the dead, Klaus has remained in constant communication with him in the years since. After becoming irritated with Ben, however, Klaus lies to their siblings after they've reunited, telling them that ghosts can't time travel when they ask about Ben. You need serious help. It's played for laughs in the show, but if you think about it, this is a particularly cruel thing for Klaus to do to Ben. Numerous times, Ben voices how much he misses his siblings and wishes to be with them again. Even though the rest of their siblings express a desire to speak to Ben, and Klaus knows he's Ben's only connection to the rest of the world, he still refuses to acknowledge Ben's presence. Klaus is likely motivated much more by pettiness than any sort of real maliciousness, but even so, punishing your dead brother by refusing to let him communicate with his loved ones just because you're annoyed is a pretty jerky thing to do. In the Umbrella Academy comics, Klaus is more of a sad character than a comedic one, but in the TV series, he largely serves to provide some laughs. This is how it's framed when it's revealed at the beginning of Season 2 that Klaus started a cult in the 1960s. While Klaus didn't set out to start a cult, he quickly realized he could get special treatment if he used his knowledge of the future and his powers to convince people that he was some sort of oracle. Klaus's cult, which he dubs Destiny's Children, is played almost entirely for laughs until he eventually abandons them to return to the future with his siblings. However, in the real world, cults are deeply problematic organizations that thrive on brainwashing, manipulation, and abuse. Viewers know Klaus isn't a predatory person, but he still wound up brainwashing his followers through lies and manipulation. After adopting his seven superpowered children as babies, Reginald Hargreaves molds them into a crime-fighting super team. But of course, defeated supervillains have to go somewhere, and in the comics, it's revealed that after being subdued by the Umbrella Academy, Reginald Hargreaves ships off the cowed baddies to the Hotel Oblivion. The Hotel Oblivion isn't really a hotel at all, but instead, it's a prison located in a hellish alternate dimension where bad guys are locked inside indefinitely. A glimpse inside one inmate's Hotel Oblivion experience shows that residents gradually go mad from isolation, that the TVs play really weird cartoons, and that the rooms are stocked with Hargreaves' authored self-help literature. In the first season of the Netflix show, Vanya spends much of the season vying for the competitive first chair violin position in her local orchestra. At the end of the season, she unleashes her newly discovered powers and winds up accidentally blowing a chunk off the moon, triggering an apocalyptic event. However, in the comics, the orchestra Vanya joins isn't just a regular musical group. Instead, it's an ensemble made up of, quote, madmen and murderesses intent on bringing about the end of the world. And they call themselves the Orchestra for Dompton, which translates to Orchestra of the Damned. The conductor of the orchestra tries to recruit Vanya early on in order to help them bring about their goal, but she refuses. However, once Vanya learns the truth of her powers and her father's deception, she returns to the orchestra for Dompton and voluntarily joins their ranks. While it's understandable that Vanya would be deeply hurt after learning that she's been lied to and manipulated her entire life, joining a group bent on destroying the world seems like overkill. This is one area where the Netflix show makes Vanya much more sympathetic. Vanya's tour of destruction, once she realizes the extent of her family's betrayal, doesn't stop at her joining a villainous orchestra. Before she heads off to her fateful performance, she also unleashes her powers on her family mansion, and in the process, she kills the family's primate caretaker, Pogo. Throughout the lives of the Hargreaves siblings, Pogo has served as both a mentor and a surrogate father figure. Vanya feels understandably betrayed when she learns that Pogo was in on Reginald's secret, but it still seems like a bridge too far when she kills him in cold blood. In the comics, she uses her powers to make his head explode, while in the Netflix series, she impales him on a pair of antlers mounted above their fireplace. 
One of a handful of important characters created just for the Netflix series is the Cunning Handler, who works for the Temps Commission and serves as both a frequent ally and nemesis of Number 5. While the Temps Commission exists to maintain and protect the timeline, the Handler's role has always felt a little more ambiguous, and she always seems to have a hidden agenda that serves only herself. So it's worrisome when, as a trade-off for giving Five a means to return himself and his siblings to their proper time after getting stuck in the 60s, she requests that he assassinate the entire board of directors of the Commission, putting her in charge. Granted, Five is rather desperate at the time, but that doesn't change the fact that he's willing to hand over control of time itself to someone entirely untrustworthy and self-serving, all in the name of getting himself and his siblings back home. No list of terrible actions committed at the hands of the Hargreaves family would be complete without mentioning the, not one, but two apocalypses the siblings have managed to cause. The first one occurs when Vanya embraces her powers as the White Violin, and blows a chunk off the moon that then comes hurtling toward Earth. That apocalypse is thwarted in the comics by Seance, and circumvented in the show by Five transporting all of his siblings back in time. But even so, there's no denying that the actions of the Umbrella Academy caused it in the first place. Did Dad say anything about the apocalypse when you spoke to him? The second takes place in the 60s, after the Academy successfully prevents the assassination of JFK, which winds up ultimately triggering a nuclear war with the USSR. Once again, it's the Hargreaves siblings interfering in the timeline that triggers the eventual apocalypse, proving that in the world of the Umbrella Academy, it's true that no good deed goes unpunished. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite comics and shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.